if I'm close to it, you can hear me. Well, good evening. My name is Gary Tartikoff, and I'm the chair of the lecture committee. Tonight we have uh, Eleanor Gaydon, who is a graduate of the University of Chicago with a specialization in the field of Indian, uh, that's India's uh, art and religion. Uh, Eleanor has taught at the School of Divinity at Harvard University and currently is teaching at the School of Arts and Crafts, California College of Arts and Crafts in Oakland. Uh, many of you have had a chance to see her book. If you have it, you may want to see it on the back table, The Once and Future Goddess. Uh, and she's also a very dear friend of mine. So I hope you'll welcome Eleanor Gayton. And let me add, this lecture is coming to you uh, courtesy of the Committee on Lectures, of course, which is funded by the government the student body and the university uh, women's program. Thank you, Gary. All right. Um, can you all hear me? Not so. Can you hear me? Is this mic on? Yeah. I don't think so. Yes. All right. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you, Gary. Um, let's see. I, uh, when Pat asked me to, uh, Pat Miller called to ask what I wanted to uh, title my talk um, a couple of months ago, I uh, was aware of, uh, increasingly so, of the politics uh, of the issues that I am uh, write about in this book and that have consumed me probably for the past 20 years uh, since I first went to India to live. Uh, I can't separate or usefully separate out the various facets of my life and interest. For one, I'm a woman and I feel that that is political in itself in our time. And my interest is in uh, uh, many things, but uh, focused within the way I as a woman see the world so that uh, I always process uh, my experience, my learning and everything else through my own context. And I really have come to believe that, uh, at least for me, uh, the fact that I am in a woman's body has influenced the way in which I perceive and see the world. Uh, the um, being, as I said, a woman, uh, in our time certainly is political, but the issues surrounding the goddess have been political for millennia. And I'm going to touch on some of that. What I'm going to do tonight is uh, through uh, a little introduction and then through slides, uh, show you some of the um, issues or the ideas that inform what I call a goddess culture, that of the prehistoric world, and then uh, talk about uh, what is being reclaimed and recovered uh, and re-emerging uh, in our culture today. People often ask how I happen to write this book. The title of my book is The Once and Future Goddess. It has a subtitle which the publishers, um, the marketing people felt it was too long, so they left off, but it really informs what it's about. It's a symbol for our time. And I was suggesting in a somewhat corny fashion that uh, the goddess um, was of the past and of the future was the appropriate symbol for the paradigm shift uh, that I feel that we are uh, now in the process of. And there's a changing, there's something shifting, changing in our culture. We're, and uh, very simplistically, and this is simplistic, I feel we're moving from perhaps what I would call a uh, patriarchal consciousness to a uh, female or feminine one. And uh, this doesn't just, this isn't just for women, it's for men as well. And I think it's imperative that we do this in order for us to survive. So that was one of the motivating things behind uh, my book. The book is the culmination of a 10 year uh, project, but its roots are earlier than that and go back to uh, the time when I first went to live in India 20 years ago. I went there uh, with my husband who taught at the Indian Institute of Management in Calcutta. And I knew nothing about India. I was a European medievalist, but I was an adventurer. And when it was his sabbatical year and he, uh, management, he was in management education that's taught everywhere in the world in English. 
and uh, the Ford Foundation was footing the bill, so we had lots of options, but I chose India. And uh, the, it was a profoundly changing experience for me. Uh, I, and I really uh, look back on it as the richest year of my life. Uh, India is a difficult place to live. It was then and continues to be. But I was a privileged Westerner. Uh, but more than that, um, I was uh, in this uh, culture which was so utterly different than anything that I had ever known, uh, able to uh, open up to certain things in myself that I probably didn't even fully understand. And so that uh, I spe have spent much of the time since then trying to uh, unravel what it is that happened to me there. And I now realize that uh, being there, uh, surrounded everywhere by images of powerful, beautiful, uh, sensual, sexual uh, female figures, uh, which are celebrated in the art and in the poetry and in the music and drama and dance, uh, that it uh, awakened something in me. And uh, I didn't know how to name this, and coming back was very hard, but now I see that this was the uh, life force. And so, and this life force, it's not that I wasn't alive before, but it, I touched deep into myself in some other way and made some connections uh, that it's not easy for a woman to do in Western culture. And um, as I uh, went to, uh, on this long pilgrimage, and it has been a, very, a pilgrimage, in quest of my understanding of the things that had changed so much deep inside of me, uh, I came to learn a lot about what it is to be a woman in the West as well as in uh, India and in the East. Uh, this has been uh, the um, basic focus of my uh, research and my teaching uh, in the years since then. Uh, it's interesting, along this way station, I came to, got to know Gary because he was my first teacher of Indian art. And uh, one of the valuable lessons I learned from him that has uh, stood me very well is the fact that uh, one understands things only in their context. So that this, the, word con the fact is that one can really only understand an image uh, if you look into the sources and roots of that, uh, that particular place. Uh, when I, uh, the next important way station in this book was uh, about 11 years ago when I went to teach in a women's program at the Harvard Divinity School. And uh, they gave me the opportunity to teach something that had interested me. I said, if this image of, of these images of this uh, cultural uh, symbol system of female in India so uh, changed me. Uh, how is it for women in the West who don't have this, and what is the impact of the um, image of the sacred female, the Virgin Mary, um, who is the um, female par excellence in Western culture? What image does this have on uh, women? Um, what influence does this have? So I put together a course which I called the um, let's see, the iconography of the sacred female in the Judeo-Christian and Hindu culture. And that analysis began then uh, to uh, many more questions. And what I'm going to do, and what I did at the end of that course was to take a look at the art that women were making. This was 11 years ago, because I said, if uh, who knows who made this ancient uh, Indian art. We don't really know, and there don't seem to be many women who made it, and we certainly uh, don't know the names of many women who made the uh, medieval or earlier Christian art. But who, who established this iconography? What then is happening now that women uh, in the current women's movement are so articulate and so vocal and so uh, uh, aware, so self-conscious, what kind of art are they making? And as I had never seen any of this art, which then was called feminist art, and the best example of this is Judy Chicago's work, or the best known one. There are many hundreds and thousands of women do this kind of work, which in some way uh, gives visual expression to uh, some sense of inner meaning for them. But as I began to uh, look at it and collect it, I realized I had my students first, and then I began to do this myself, to think about spinning uh, a new mythology.
I'm going to read you just a little bit from the book before, and then I'm going to tell my story through pictures. Uh, when I tell people I'm writing about the goddess, they inevitably ask which one. While the goddess has indeed had many names and many manifestations throughout human history, ultimately she is one supreme reality. Only after the patriarchal Indo-Europeans overthrew the cultures where the goddess had flourished from earliest times and imposed the worship of their sky gods was her identity fractured into myriad goddesses, each with an all-too-human personality. And we know these goddesses best from Greek and Roman mythology. But I'm also speaking of the goddess not just as a divine force, but also as a metaphor and symbol for a uh, sacred female and for some changes that are taking place in our culture. Uh, but it's always good to go begin at the beginning. So first, I just want to reconstruct for you some of the key themes in the prehistoric goddess religion. Uh, it's important to understand that for most of human, uh, most a time of, of humankind, uh, that people worshiped uh, a female uh, divine figure, uh, not only and, and continue primal peoples and many other third world peoples continue to do so today. The accumulating archaeological evidence affirms overwhelmingly that prehistoric peoples worshipped a female deity. This evidence and the earliest writing document the persistence of goddess religion for nearly thirty thousand years, beginning in the late Paleolithic, the Ice Age. With the coming of agriculture in the Neolithic age that followed, the religion of the goddess flowered. Uh, this was an earth-centered, not heaven-centered uh, religion of this world, not otherworldly, body-affirming, not body-denying, holistic, not dualistic. The goddess was imminent within every human being, not transcendent, and humanity was viewed as part of nature, death as part of life. Her worship was sensual, celebrating the erotic, embracing all that was alive. The religious quest was above all for renewal, for the regeneration of life, and the goddess was the life force. In this context, religion is a problematic word. Way of life would be more apt. The word religion conjures up the great monotheistic world faith, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, all revealed traditions. Hinduism and Buddhism, also considered great world religions, do not fit this model because they are not based on revelation. Their followers consider their paths as ways of life embracing the whole, not a dimension of experience separate and apart from the ordinary. All of life is sacred. The word comes from the Latin religio, to rebind. We might ask then, what has had become unbound? Before the onslaught of patriarchy and the suppression of the goddess, all that lived was bound into a sacred fabric, the larger web of the life force, part of the whole. All were responsible to each other and responsible for the ongoing rhythms of life. Death and rebirth. Humankind, women equally with men, animals and plants, rocks and rivers, the planet Earth and its atmosphere. This integration of the whole has never been achieved in monotheistic religions. Rather, they have led us to an ever-accelerating severance of nature from culture, bringing us in the late 20th century to the brink of species and planet annihilation. And as we examine what we know about the goddess religion, myth and ritual, we must be willing to take an imaginative leap to discover in living cultures clues such as the Hindu, India, and Native Americans, clues to the meaning of early images and practice. Working with the fragmentary archaeological evidence now being unearthed is like trying to piece together a gargantuan jigsaw puzzle in which some of the pieces are lost and others broken and there is no picture to show what the completed puzzle looks like. 
but the surviving evidence for the worship of a female deity is overwhelming. We will use the art and artifacts as key to our reconstruction. These are tangible records of human experience, meditations on the mystery of the source of our being. The noted historian of religion, uh, Marcia Eliotti, tells us that symbolic thinking is an essential part of human nature, coming before language and discursive reasoning. Images, symbols, and myths respond to a need and fill a function, bringing to light the deepest aspects of reality which defy any other means of knowledge. I'm going to repeat that because that's what uh, I believe that we can only really know what we can image, and that's why uh, the surviving uh, evidence of prehistoric cultures is so important. Uh, images, symbols, and myths respond to a need and fill a function bringing to light the deepest aspects of reality, which defy any other means of knowledge. Every historical man and woman carries on within themselves a great deal of prehistorical humanity. The mind uses images to grasp the ultimate reality of things. It is the image of the mother, with capital M, the goddess, which reveals, and which alone can reveal, her functions at once cosmological, anthropological, and psychological. In reclaiming the goddess, in recovering our full human history as women and men, we can learn other patterns of behavior. We can redress the imbalance between the human species and our natural environment, between men and women, exploring the possibility of living in harmony and justice with all things. This book is not about the idealization of women, but about life, connection, and responsibility. Let's have the slides. Gary, I'm sorry, be better. I didn't check out how I was to operate here. Is there a light? Okay, I don't really need a light, but do I, uh, how do I push the slides forward? I oh, I don't, you, you're going to do I, I, it. I'm going to do it. Okay, all right. I just want to see right there. Okay. Uh, let's uh, have, let's skip the one on the right and go on to the, on my right. No, I want the one on the other, I'm sorry, that one, Gary. Okay, let's start here. Um, it's always useful to begin in the beginning, and I'm going back now to the uh, late uh, Paleolithic. Uh, some... 35,000 years ago when human beings uh, were just uh, like we are now. Modern man, uh, homo sapiens, sapiens, uh, wise, wise man, uh, was fully evolved. And uh, the, they had the same uh, brain capacity, the same physical capability, the same ability to uh, think symbolically and uh, to form community and to bond. Uh, like us, they must have uh, wondered, speculated, about the meaning of life and death. Uh, they uh, understood the earth as the source of all life and ground of being. They looked around them. Uh, they were hunters and gatherers with highly skilled powers of observation. Uh, looking around them in their community at the women, uh, they noticed uh, the life process in a woman's body of menstruation, pregnancy, childbirth, lactation. And by analogy, they imaged the earth as a great womb out of which all life came and to which life returned at death only to be reborn. They created these small votive images. Uh, more than 200 of them have been found. This is the Earth Mother of Wielendorf. Wielendorf is in Austria, and she was found about 100 years ago. She's carved from limestone and is about four and a half inches in size, just the right size to hold in a clasping hand. 
you'll notice that she doesn't uh, have any face. This is not a specific woman. This is generic sacred female. Uh, those parts of her body that have to do with procreation have been exaggerated, but this is not as um, reviewers have often said, uh, a fertility fetish. It's neither for a individual woman's uh, fertility nor is a fetish which is put down. This was a sacred icon. These uh, small votive objects, uh, images, were found at the dwelling places. Uh, the other great art of the uh, late Paleolithic are the wonderful animal uh, paintings on the cave walls, but those were their cathedrals. Uh, they were in sanctuaries deep inside the womb of the mother. But in the places where they lived, and they didn't live in the caves, they lived either in rock shelters, at, sometimes at the entrance of caves, or in the open field uh, around a hearth. Often they lived in places that were on hills with a good view. They needed a water supply, and they, needed to, they wanted to be able to see uh, the animals, uh, the great herds that would, that would come in the, as the seasons of the year changed. Now, um, in imaging this, uh, or creating the iconography of this sacred uh, female, uh, they uh, gave special attention to those parts of her body, like her, those pendulous breasts and the great full hips, uh, her protruding abdomen, maybe she's pregnant, and the uh, genital area, the vulva, those parts which have to do with uh, the uh, creation of new life. The vulva is called uh, the sacred triangle and should be understood as the threshold um, from which life emerged. Uh, notice that she has no feet. Uh, she was intended to be uh, set into the soft earth and to be worshipped, and her hands uh, are just spindly as they cross over her bosom. Uh, those, uh, they weren't important, the hands or feet. Now, more than 200 of these have been found from uh, Spain to central Siberia. No two are exactly alike, but they share many common characteristics. The next two. There should be one. Uh, this is the Earth Mother of Locelle. From an, this is from France. Uh, from South Central France, and uh, she is the only one of these um, Earth Mothers from the late Paleolithic that's carved in situ. That is, she's carved on the uh, face of a rock shelter. Uh, if you can imagine, uh, the rock shelter uh, is the entrance to a sanctuary. There are other objects, other uh, sacred images are carved on the wall, and lots of artifacts, which were votive objects, were found on the floors. Uh, she's carved right over the entrance, uh, like uh, the portal to a great cathedral. You can imagine this is equivalent to, perhaps, to uh, uh, the image of Christ in majesty, a chart. Again, uh, she has the same characteristics as Wielendorf, the exaggerated parts of her body that have to do with procreation. But in addition, she's holding a notched bison horn in her hand. Uh, this is notched with 13 notches. And this may be the, uh, one of the earliest calendars. Uh, these people had a lunar calendar, 13 lunar months in the year. But also, this may uh, be the, uh, have to do with the 13 months of the menstrual cycle. And uh, perhaps the keeping uh, track of the menstrual cycle uh, was the first calendar. Uh, there is some connection between uh, women's uh, menstrual cycle and uh, the phases of the moon. I uh, notice that the bison horn is moon-shaped. Uh, women uh, in, still today who live together often menstruate, have their periods in cycle together, and perhaps in an earlier time it's speculated that all women in a community would have menstruated together and perhaps in rhythm with the phases of the moon. The cyclical aspect of women's uh, life process uh, puts them in touch with uh, cosmic time. Uh, there is some connection between the natural rhythms in a woman's body and the um, 
cycles of the moon and the tides. This is a memory of something that's very, very ancient in humankind. Both uh, Willendorf and Lozell are marked with red pigmented earth. Uh, red ochre, and this is used uh, in all parts of the world uh, in burial practices and other places and symbolizes uh, blood, the life fluid. Next. Right. The um, omnipresent sign on the cave walls is this vulva sign. Uh, the French archaeologist Leroy Grouin, among others, uh, has documented all of the uh, carving, engraving, and painting on all of the caves in France. And, this, uh, and here is a, uh, from a book by the science writer Alexander Marshak, uh, are a selection of uh, the various forms that they take. Now, uh, I want you to stretch your mind a little perhaps bend your imagination to uh, really put aside whatever uh, even uh, limited or inklings you would have of the, any titillation about the fact that this is uh, the female genitalia, which in our culture is often something that is not, not only denigrated, but uh, made uh, trivialized. Uh, this was uh, important uh, sacred business. Now, it's not easy to know what it is that this meant. Again, coming back to the context, Marshak, whose drawings, uh, these are from his book, spent 20 years trying to understand uh, the, some patterns, trying to look for patterns in the uh, marks that he found both on the cave walls and on the portable art that he found at these um, uh, dwelling sites. And uh, what um, he came up with some very interesting uh, observations or connections. Let's have the next two. No, there should be something else on the other side. Yeah, well, no, no, this one on the right was right, but on the that one, no, there should be another. Let's try. Oh, that one I want. Okay. Uh, what you see on my left is uh, from a. Um, it's engraving and painting from a cave in uh, 17,000 years ago in, in Spain. And on the right, uh, that is your, my right, but your, your left, is a painting on a wall from a tribal house in India, a contemporary one, done sometime in the 70s. Uh, what we, what Marshak uh, concluded was that these, uh, one way of understanding what these signs meant uh, was to look at associated symbols. And there you see growing up among the vulva signs is a plant form. Uh, this wasn't always recognizable, but we have as a plant, some of the archaeologists who first worked on this or the prehistorians thought of it as a weapon, but it has the, it doesn't look, I mean, it's, it's the wrong direction for a weapon. So when we think then of that, the association of the vulva signs and the plant, uh, confirm uh, its meaning as uh, the threshold out of which life comes. And when we look at the modern uh, painting from uh, symbol from India, we find again that in this sacred triangle, there is a uh, plant is emerging. So for these early people, uh, this, uh, there was a great reverence and uh, respect for uh, the female and the life-giving process. Their religion was about the continuity of life itself. Next two. Uh, all right, Gary, uh, well, anyway, the one that, uh, the small amulet that you see there on your right is uh, from the Holy Land. This is the goddess Astarte, and you'll notice this was made uh, probably about the year 1200. And uh, the, in the symbol system of that time, uh, she, we don't need to say anything else about her sacred nature except to give her a pretty face and a hairdo and small breasts, a navel, and then a very prominent sacred triangle. The, can we have the next one on the... Uh, Right. Yeah. 
Uh, we're back in India again, and we're looking at a uh, carving, a bas relief from a goddess temple from the 10th century. And see, there are two holy men are worshiping at the yoni, which is the uh, Sanskrit term for the uh, sacred triangle of the goddess. Uh, on the left is a uh, painting from an 18th century painting from Rajasthan of a yantra, that is a sacred diagram used as a meditation aid, which again uh, shows the downward pointing triangle, uh, this time set on a lotus leaf. The lotus is the seat of the gods and goddesses. Uh, it's a cosmic diagram uh, open to the four directions. And in the center is the bindu, which is the seed of life. All right, let's continue. Uh, in the Neolithic age, which followed, uh, which was the, uh, uh, the Paleolithic is the Old Stone Age, and there was a shift then to, uh, from hunting and gathering to agriculture. And uh, with, ag with the, uh, in the beginning, it was just a simple hooter cultural, and then in time, they uh, totally into subsistence agriculture. But uh, there, with a changing lifestyle, uh, there was a need for some new symbols. And what we see here in this drawing on the uh, neck of the goddess is uh, our symbols for rain, for water, because agricultural peoples are dependent upon water. Uh, when I was driving here this morning or this afternoon from uh, the uh, airport in, De in Des Moines, uh, the Kathy who brought me commented on how wonderful it had been last summer that after your summers of drought you had had torrential rains. So I'm sure you can appreciate uh, how important uh, in the agricultural world that you live the rain is. So the goddess was then the bringer of the rains. And sometimes there would be tears streaming down her eyes that represented rain. Uh, there is a whole symbolic language that has been identified that has to do with either the rain or waters from, from above. The waters came from two places, from above and from below. And so they imaged the goddess as uh, a bird who knew the waters above and a snake, the waters below, next to all right, so here you have this. These are two images from the culture of old Europe. That is the Neolithic culture of Europe about uh, 7,000 years ago. And uh, the uh, bird, uh, you can make out the fact it's highly abstracted, but there is a red painted wing. And uh, the snake uh, goddess is sitting in a uh, yogic position, uh, the spiraling rounds of the snake uh, skin uh, making her form. Uh, both uh, this, this uh, seated position that the snake goddess has is a very common one in the Neolithic period when uh, many of the images uh, of the goddess, the predominant ones, uh, are squatting, uh, perhaps in the position in which women gave birth uh, uh, in most parts of the world until the onset of modern um, obstetrical practice. Uh, the snake goddess, again, both of these images have a long, high neck. And uh, this can be understood, uh, perhaps, as incorporating both male and female principle in the body of the goddess. And the goddess in this time, uh, people may have believed that she gave birth parthenogenically, that is, by herself. So in the symbol system of the goddess in Neolithic Europe, often we see these parthenogenic forms. When I speak about the um, goddess culture, I'm not in any way suggesting that it's an analog to the patriarchy that we know. I uh, have no evidence for there ever having been a matriarchy. Patriarchy is a dominance of the male over the female. In these uh, goddess cultures, uh, were women-centered, but they, uh, male and female, existed together, men and women, uh, under an overarching principle of the uh, goddess. It's very hard for us to understand this, because uh, in our worldview, and I'm talking here about worldviews, 
uh, we are so used to thinking in dualistically and also in terms of dominance and the key perhaps to our understanding of the way the world works is power. Um, there's a different kind of power here. It's not a power over, but an enabling power, a power within that. Uh, and uh, there, well, there, it's not that everything was peaceful and rosy and wonderful all the time, but there was, is no evidence in uh, Neolithic Europe or in the uh, other, uh, in the Near East uh, of any warfare. Uh, these people seem to have been peaceful, egalitarian, and prosperous. Uh, I want to just uh, tell you an anecdote that, of something that happened to me about two weeks ago. I was at a conference, an international conference on shamanism, and this perhaps will illustrate how this problem of changing consciousness. And at this conference, Mickey Hart, of the drummer for the Grateful Dead, uh, was there reading from his new book on uh, the shaman as drummer or the drummer is shaman, I guess is what he called it. And he's a charming man and looks something like Adel of the Hun. He's from Hungary and he has that dark, small, intense look. But he, um, he concluded his talk by saying that most shamans were men or had always been men. And more than half the people at the conference were women. They were uh, therapists and um, anthropologists and historians of religion and perhaps some called themselves shamans. Anyway, they probably protested. And he very charmingly said, oh, well, he knew all about the mother goddess. And then he said he had read my book. He didn't know I was there. But what he said then was that in the, old, in the ancient world, women were dominant and they had the goddess. And then uh, men became dominant and they had the sky gods. And now women were going to be dominant again and the goddess was going to return. And I... Uh, introduced myself and I said he hadn't read my book very carefully. He protested <laughs> and so he had, but I realized as he backed himself into a corner that uh, very defensively that how hard it was that it really was outside of his conception that there surely that someone wouldn't dominate. And part, so I'm suggesting here that among the possibilities for this reconstruction that we're doing of another culture is to imagine things another way. Uh, much of what I say, I very carefully uh, looked at whatever I could lay my hands on in the archeological evidence and the most recent uh, reports and interpretations. I'm not an archeologist or a prehistorian, and this is a book for the general public. I put together a lot of information that makes sense to me. But I know that this is a very volatile field. Archaeologists are notably very conservative. Uh, and that, uh, but the level of activity in the field is such that 20 years from now, we may understand more about these things and in a different way. But I think it's important to try to begin to make some sense out of the overwhelming archaeological evidence that has emerged in the, since World War II. Let's see, to get back to, yes, uh, the, uh, I'm going to just briefly give you, run through some more of these icons, uh, suggesting uh, just very briefly what their meaning is. Uh, this is an, one from Neolithic Egypt, uh, the pre-dynastic. And there we have, it's a beautiful small uh, figure. There are many of these have been found. This particular one is from the Brooklyn Museum. Uh, you'll notice that she has a bird-like face. Her hands are upraised like this in a gesture of drawing down the sun uh, so that it will uh, nurture the crops. Uh, to tell you something of how controversial or how strongly some of the uh, people feel about uh, the interpretation of these images, the Brooklyn Museum would only allow me to use this if I didn't call it a goddess, if I just referred to it as a female figure, and uh, which I, I wanted to have. It's very beautiful, and I wanted to have it in the book. Uh, my own um, understanding, which is certainly seasoned by my uh, experience of, uh, of studying Indian culture, is that people don't make objects that look like this that, uh, for any reason other than to, for some sacred uh, or what we would call religious purpose. Next. 
Uh, this is one of my favorites and uh, tells something of, uh, though this is from India and from a later time, uh, this tells something of uh, the meaning of the, uh, the goddess uh, for an agricultural people. This is Sri Lakshmi. She is the goddess of abundance. And she, uh, this is from the second century and made of lovely uh, rose pink, uh, be pink beige sandstone. Uh, she's uh, not naked. She's wearing a diaphanous lower garment and it was the fashion probably uh, certainly uh, for privileged women in those days not to wear anything up top at all. It's quite hot in India, not necessary. Uh, she, her countenance, her face is very sweet, her expression, and she is holding with one hand, she's cupping a full round breast. In Indian poetry, we often hear that the woman's breast is likened to a full round pot of water. Uh, the, with her other hand, she's pointing again to that sacred threshold out of which life comes. She's standing on two lotus pods in a pot full of water. The overflowing pot of water in Indian culture is always uh, a uh, sign of uh, good things, of auspiciousness. It will stand outside the uh, threshold on a sacred occasion. But most dramatically, growing up her back is this oversized lotus plant and uh, in which uh, the stand two peacocks. The peacocks represent passion, but the lotus itself is the, grows out of the waters. And it's the understanding in Indian culture that all life comes from the waters, and we know that this is so scientifically. So Lakshmi and this lotus plant are one. And uh, the sense of the interconnection of all of life is so beautifully realized here. Next. This is uh, the Aztec goddess uh, giving birth and a very powerful image. Uh, it's, uh, we can, she's not giving birth to a human child. She is the mother giving birth to all humankind. And in, the, in this image, we can see something of the enormous energy and uh, uh, the uh, intent uh, that happens, the power in her body as this child uh, is thrust out. Next. Uh, this is uh, a landscape, hills in County Kerry in Ireland called the Pops of Anu. Uh, pops are breasts, uh, and Anu is the Celtic goddess. Uh, in a, the, the uh, Neolithic time, all of the land was sacred. The very surface of the land was considered the body of the mother. Native Americans uh, hold this idea, and the whole of the subcontinent of India is considered to be the body of the goddess. There are many uh, landscapes in many parts of the country that also, uh, as the, in the configuration of the uh, land itself, looks like the body of a woman. Uh, the architectural historian Vincent Scully, in studying the siting of the temples in the greater Greek world in classical time, found that they were all sited in relation to two round hills with a cleft in between, which he uh, set, which he interpreted as the body of the Earth Mother. Uh, we are now also again in Ireland, and this is in Newgrange in Ireland. Uh, this is in a long uh, barrow that was built in the megalithic period, oh, some 5,000 years ago. And here you see uh, the light coming in. This happens only one day of the year. That is at the time of the winter solstice in December. And uh, at that time, the light goes into the long barrow and illuminates the triple spiral that you see there. Uh, the triple spiral is a uh, important uh, common symbol uh, in the goddess uh, worldview, and it means life, death, and rebirth. 
Uh, the uh, time is cyclical. It's not, we're used to thinking in a linear way that the world began on a certain day, will end on a certain day, but this is not the point of view in this uh, culture. Uh, every, there is always, there is life, there is death, and then there's rebirth, and what uh, their uh, religion is about is this ongoing life itself. Uh, these people were well aware of the movements of the heavens and of the cycles of the season, and their rituals were held uh, in, uh, with that understanding and honoring that. Uh, another important associative symbol of the goddess was the snake. Again, the snake which sheds its skin, uh, that's life, death, and rebirth. Uh, and here we have the Minoan uh, snake goddess uh, holding two snakes, she, or this may the, be the priestess uh, sitting in for the goddess. Uh, her, her eyes are bulging. She probably is in trance. Yeah. Is there nothing on the other screen? There should be. There. Can we have the goddess back? and focus this. Uh, the goddess culture at, um, in Crete, uh, this was the full flowering of the goddess culture. And this was a um, highly refined culture uh, with uh, great uh, skill in arts and crafts and a very free and creative society. Uh, the, uh, here we see on a fresco from a palace temple wall uh, the uh, offerings being brought to uh, either a queen or a priestess. Uh, we don't know, we've not been able to decipher their script, so we don't know exactly who ruled there, but there is no evidence in any of the frescoes or artifacts of any male ruler. So perhaps uh, the priestess of the goddess uh, did rule there. In any case, uh, she officiated in the palace, uh, the, um, shrine, that's where this image on the uh, right was found, next to. One of the most uh, dramatic of the frescoes in the palace shows the bull leaping ritual which took place uh, deep within the palace uh, building. Uh, it's a palace shrine temple and many like five levels down uh, there would have been a great ritual hall in which these um, young men and women, highly trained in perfect uh, rhythm with um, the uh, animal, uh, would do this extremely difficult uh, feat. Uh, you can imagine this is a charging bull who might have weighed a ton, and it's very important that, all th all that they act in concert uh, as uh, one, uh, somebody tumbles over, somersaults over the back of the bull and is caught by the uh, woman in the, behind the bull. Uh, the women's bodies were...